Okay, this is Jerry Logan, Professor Jerry Logan, talking to you all in the PowerPoint presentation I have for Chapter 1 of the Intro to Sociology course. Um, what I'm going to do today is go over the different parts of Chapter 1. And I'm going to do this like a two-part session because of the fact that uh, it's a very long chapter. So I believe the first part I'm going to talk about uh, introduction of sociology and the sociological uh, sociological thinkers, as well as the second part, I'm going to lead more into public, basic, and applied sociology, and then lead to the sociological theory. So I'm going to have this in two parts. Uh, chapter one will be part one and part two. So this starts part one on the introduction of sociology uh, course, and I will present it in the PowerPoint presentation and lecture to you as well so that you'll have the feel of actually being in the course um, as well as you know being able to pause and stop and be able to rewind certain things so let me start by first talking about the definition of sociology sociology now whenever I read a chapter whenever I look at things I always look at one word at a time now when I look at the definition of sociology which I put up here is a science meaning to be tested of social society. There are also the social institutions, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and the uh, social relationships. But it specifically is the systematic study of the development, structure, interaction, and collective behavior of organized groups of human beings. It is also a scientific analysis of a social institution as a functioning whole as it relates to the rest of society. So then again, you look at the whole thing that mentioned is sociology is a function and whole and how it relates to the rest of society. I'll get back into more of that in a little bit. Origin of sociology is tradition versus science. Remember, science requires theories that can be tested by research. The systematic method is using objective, systematic observation to test theories. We'll be talking about the theories later on in part two of chapter one. And the question is, with traditional answers failing, the next step was to apply the scientific method to answer questions about social life. Next slide. The sociological information, imagination. It is the ability to connect the most basic, intimate <clears throat> aspect of an individual's life to seemingly impersonal and remote historical forces. Now, the social institution is a complex group of interdependent positions that together perform a social role and reproduce themselves over time. So I'm gonna break this down in a little bit. It also is defined in narrow sense as any institution in a society that works to shape the behavior of the groups or people within it. So. As we look into the social institutions, we think about what are some of the things that help shape your behavior that a society consists of as an institution. So when a baby is born, of course, the first persons that they meet is their parents, their family. So one of the family is one of the social institutions. And if you look at the definition again, is that it's a complex group of interdependent positions. Together, they perform a social role and reproduce themselves over time it is in society that works to shape the behavior of the groups of people within it. So in a sense that society is counting on you, as you have children, to raise your children up to be a member of a functioning society. Now, it's, a, it's the belief that the society will be functioning, but all parts and persons have to play a role in making sure that everything is okay, that we have a, and I get more into the functionist perspective what society is functioning. So each parent who have children have a role, and including the family, extended family members as well, who have plays a role in shaping the behavior of a child. We can get into the socialization process, which is a later chapter, the culture, because culture and socialization is very huge when you're talking about the uh, social institutions, because each society a culture has a particular type of social institution that is in place. Family is always present in any type of culture, across culture and across the world. Family is a common theme that goes on with each and every society. 
So the family has a role, if we think about it, you know, as far as you having children. When you're having children, the first thing you do is you want your child to be socialized to the culture of the family. So you're going to raise your child or socialize your child based upon the culture of the family so that the child learn the values and norms, and we'll talk about that later in culture as well, of what it means to be a member of the family. So each family themselves, they have a list of rules, they have a list of uh, cultures and behaviors, uh, of patterns of things they've always done, and so you have to teach that child to be a member of that. But one of the things besides the family as a social institution, the next thing is you have this baby, the baby's growing up. Another social institution is the education. Each society has a form of education of educating its members in the society. So if we think about it, we have a baby, the baby's getting older, now the child has a system in place uh, that perform a social role is to go have a child to attend school. Now once the child attends school, there's another part of that social institution which helps shape the behavior of the groups of people within it. So the school, you go to school, there is a system in place. Just say in the United States, for example, kids go to with a Head Start, kindergarten, first, second, third, fifth grade, junior high, seventh, eighth grade, on to high school, and different. So there's already a system in place in which we are used to educate our children. So not only does the parents become a role model or a social role that they play in, in shaping the behavior of a child, the teachers also have a responsibility of educating the children and also trying to teach them to be a member of society as well as trying to shape their behavior in a positive manner. So society is counting on this. They're looking for and say, you know what, we want to make sure that our society is functioning and we want everyone to be a member of the society and be as a functioning whole so therefore that they understand the rules of what it is to be a member of society. So one of the other things that comes into place is that just say for parents, the social institutions in place, if you don't listen to your parents, then also you have the teachers in place. So a lot of times the teachers can have a positive, if I know mine did growing up, a positive impact in your life where they can become a role model to you as a someone who they can communicate with and to be able to help work with you and through any problems that you have. So not only is the family a social institution, the education system is a social institution. Also in every culture and across society, there is a form of religion. Despite whatever religious, if it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Buddha, whatever you try to uh, worship as far as a religion, religion plays a role also in shaping the behavior of the group or people within it. So a lot of times the religion itself can play a role in what should I do, what I could and should I do what's good or bad. So religion plays a key role in help shaping your behavior. So it's the role of the pastor, the rabbi, the priest, uh, whoever it may be, uh, the deacons of the church, whoever it may be, that person does play a role in shaping a behavior, uh, especially as you're growing up as a younger person. So depending on the culture of your family, you may be socialized and say, hey, we're Catholic, we're gonna to continue to raise our children as Catholic or this is my religion, I'm going to continue to raise this child in the form of the religion. And that being said, uh, so the religion plays a positive role in helping shape the behavior for a lot of people. It turns a lot of people around because they go to the religion as a way to be a member of society and say, hey, I'm going to do something positive, especially helping other people as well. So going back to the other social institutions, if you don't listen to your family members, there's also your teachers, the education. Don't listen to your teachers. Then also the members of the church and your religion shapes a role. So if those things are not working, of course, the next thing, another social institution is the law. Forms of government in which there are rules that are put in place if you violate the law, which can lead to incarceration or can lead to a fine or some type of you know, a negative outcome if you don't follow what the law is. So some people may say, you know what, the law does shape the behavior of the groups of people within this because people understand that I have to obey the law, or otherwise these are consequences. So if you don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your teachers, don't listen to the persons in the clergy, the church, 
Also, I have to deal with the judge or police officer. So these social institutions are here in place. And there's other social institutions, the mass media, uh, the culture. Do When we talk about the culture in the media, I'm going to talk about that later in the culture on chapter, uh, the chapter on culture in which that the media and the, the media has a way of sending a message to the culture and people are learning about the culture through the mass media. And as they're learning about the culture through the mass media, the mass media play a role in shaping your behavior. So whether it's through the rap videos and the music videos or through the fashion you wear or through the sports, everything else. So the media plays a major role, but I'm going to get into that later. Of course, this is all information for the exam that you'd be aware of, the sociological imagination, social institutions. Next slide. So here are some examples of the social institutions, the family, laws and government, religion, education, mass media, military. There's also some form of military, uh, to, to also as far as external threats to the society or group. So there's usually some form of a military or some form of protection to prevent outsiders from coming in to harm its members. Next slide, we talk about tradition versus sciences. What I wanted to bring up on this one was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, masses of people moved to the cities in search of work. So one of the things is before I, I want to kind of me briefly mention this as I get into Karl Marx in a little bit, how we were in the agricultural society in the United States. And then of course, here comes the industrial revolution where things move to this, more factories are being built. Uh, people moving far, far from an agricultural society uh, into these cities and factories and working and which caused a change as well in the structure of society. I'll talk about that a little bit later when I introduce Karl Marx. So I brought this one in as just a reminder of the French Revolution. I know uh, a lot of students just got out of high school. They're pretty young. I graduated from high school 100 years ago, but I do briefly remember the French Revolution, uh, which comes out from August Comte, in which he analyzed how societies change. If we go back into the French Revolution, in which the society had course of society had changed, in which the king and, king and the queen were overthrown, uh, I believe they were beheaded, in the sense that it changed the course of a society and that stimulated August Comte to analyze how does these societies change. August Comte, he is uh, recredited as the founder of sociology. Uh, began, he began to order, analyze the basis of the social order. Uh, he did stress that the scientific method should be applied to study of society. However, he did not apply himself. So therefore, August Comte, he is credited as being the founder of sociology. Uh, so make sure you be aware that the founder of sociology is August Comte. Comte originally studied to be an engineer, but later became a pupil of, of a social philosopher. Uh, let me work on his name. Claude Henry de Revoy Comte de Saint Simon. Hopefully I got it right, but it's something like that. Uh, they both thought that social scientists could use, could study society under the same scientific method utilizing natural sciences. Comte believed in the potential of so or social scientists to work to, uh, toward the betterment of society, so they believed in a form of social reform. He held that once scholars identified the laws that govern society, sociologists could address problems such as poor education and poverty. So. Uh, make sure you're familiar with August Comte. And if you look at the time frame, this is back early in this 18, early 1800s. So this was a long time ago uh, in which all of this stuff took place. Comte named the scientific study of social patterns. He called it positivism. He described his philosophy in a series of books called The Course in Positive Philosophy, 1830 to 1842, and A General View of Positivism, 1848. He believed that using scientific methods to reveal the laws by which societies and individuals interact will usher in a new positivist age of history. So make sure you are familiar with August Comte and positivism. Comte also analyzed what's to hold a society together, what creates a social order. 
He stated, once societies become set on a particular course, what causes it to change? And as a recap, he called this new science sociology. He discovered social principles, but also applied them to social reform. Sociologists stated, uh, excuse me, Comte stated that a sociologist would reform the entire society, make it a better place to live. So make sure you are familiar with August Comte, who is the founder of sociology, which of course will be on my exam. Next slide, Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer is a very popular guy. He was in my business courses for my doctorate degree, uh, for my MBA as well. Herbert Spencer, very controversial. Uh, of course, this is 1820 to 1903, so none of us were really there. So there's different perceptions of what actually is the story of Herbert Spencer. So I've read numerous stories about he felt this way, some say he didn't feel this way, some say he came off a little bit harsh, uh, but then some people say no he didn't. Uh, so it's a lot, and, and, and as independent thinkers, it's always time for you to do research as well. So due to time constraints because of the chapter, I'm just briefly introducing who these sociologists are. You are always welcome to continue to do research and learn more about all of these individuals. Herbert Spencer, the word sometimes called the second founder of sociology, coined the term survival of the fittest, in which he was, you can kind of go back into Charles Darwin a little bit about his theory of evolution. And when you go back to the theory of evolution with Charles Darwin, he talked about the survival of the fittest. Some say, well, Herbert Spencer talked about it before Charles Darwin did. Uh, if you all remember Charles Darwin, theory of evolution, that species uh, would have to adapt to the changing environment in order for them to survive. If they did not survive, uh, they were less, more likely just to die out or not to be able to continue. Now, I'm not a science person, so that's my perception of Charles Darwin. Feel free again to be able to look up the information, but that is the perception of we looking at sociology uh, in which Herbert Spencer, the social Darwinism. This person, uh, Herbert Spencer also was, you know, thought of as stated that he wanted the societies to, the more fit people to advance society. So the more capable, the more fit people should be the ones to advance in a society, uh, making it a better, better place to live. And those who were poor and less fit, he basically said just helping them was wrong. And this is merely help to let the less fit survive. So it's kind of like, okay, just let them, don't even help them out a little bit. Don't put the services in place, kind of like Compton did when he studied looking at the a larger scale of studying people and in society and making it a best, better place to live through social reform. And Herbert Spencer thought a little bit differently, saying that helping the poor was wrong, that this merely helped the less fit survive. Of course, some people may disagree and say, nah, that's not what he said, because I've read stories about, well, Herbert Spencer really didn't come off that meme, and this is not what he said. So I just want to introduce this to Herbert Spencer, social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Uh, he's also credited as being the second founder of sociology. Next slide. Uh, again, he disagrees sharply with Compton's idea that sociologists should guide social reform. He believed in lower and higher forms of society and he coined the phrase survival of the fittest. Karl Marx. Believe, 1818-1883. And remember in my courses, I'm not going to test you on dates. You know, what happened in 1855, 1856. I really don't do that. So I just want to get you all in the time frame. Of course, when you're looking at the lack of technology and the lack of the resources, uh, but we have people who were putting in work, so to say, so that they can study society and study people. Karl Marx believed that the roots of human misery lay in what he called class conflict the exploitation of workers by those who own the means of production. Social change in the form of the workers overthrowing the capitalists was inevitable from Marx's perspective. So let me kind of paint a picture for you. So we talked about the Industrial Revolution. So therefore, if I'm a farmer and I'm like, I have a family, I'm like, okay, we're not making money like we used to because of this Industrial Revolution. And everybody's migrated to the city to, for work. They build these large factories and a lot of machinery going on. So, of course, I'm like, I need to take care of my family, so therefore I'm going to move to the big city. 
But what happens when you get to this big city? When you get to this big city, there's about a thousand of us out here looking for work. And if you look at the factory owners, as Karl Marx say, those who own the means of production, the capitalists, they look out, just say they look out the window and say, you know what, there's a thousand people outside. We just built this new factory and we have room for 300 people to hire. So therefore, in, 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 a, in, a, in a viewpoint that there's limited resources and limited jobs for everybody. So therefore, a capitalist or a person who owns the means of production can change the role of that particular job. So now we don't have to give them a break. We don't have to give them lunch breaks because they need this job. So therefore, the working conditions may not be, even though it may be bad, but you have, if a worker complains, you can just open the door and say, look, if you don't want this job, there's a thousand other people out here who want your job right now. And therefore, you think about your family, so I got to go back to work. So one of the things that Karl Marx talked about was exploitation of workers, meaning that workers were exploited, they didn't have the safe working conditions, they didn't have certain breaks and things like that. And Karl Marx that believed that if you wanted that change, if you wanted to be recognized, if you wanted those things in place, and that's when he states social change in the form of the workers overthrowing the capitalists, but he said it was inevitable. He also described it as a bloody revolution in which one would be free of exploitation and a class of society. So there was two forms of classes, the upper class and the lower class, and I get a little bit to later, we talk about Strauss's stratification when he talks a little bit with Max Weber regarding their opinion of class consciousness. I'll talk about that later in my other chapters. He also uh, is a part of what they call the conflict theory. I'll get into conflict theory in the second uh, part of here. The conflict theory in itself is a viewpoint uh, that shares the, it shares the viewpoints of Karl Marx and the conflict theory, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So when you think about conflict theory for the exams, you also keep in mind about Karl Marx. He believed, Karl Marx believed that societies grow and change as a result of the struggle of different social classes over the means of production. At this time, he was developing his theories, the industrial revolution and the rise of capitalists led to great disparities in wealth between the owners of the factories and the workers, what I briefly talked about before. Remember, capitalism is an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of goods and the means to produce them that grew in many nations. So when we get into many nations, I get into my other chapter, which you all get to uh, learn about. We talk about global stratification, you know, so that's in later on, but this is just the intro. Uh, I have a lot of information in my PowerPoints and slides and I'm a talker, of course. I can continue on and on for hours. I've talked for three and a half hours in courses, but I'm gonna try to limit this down so you all won't be fast forwarding this a little bit <laughs> through my PowerPoint presentation. So make sure you know this slide as well. Like Comte, uh, Marx thought that people should try to change society. Marx's proposal for change was radical, which he mentioned as a bloody revolution. He believed the engine of human misery, again, is class conflict. Two classes, he called them the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, those who own the means of production, and then there was the proletariat, the exploited workers. So make sure you're familiar with that, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, and, and exploited workers, which are considered as the proletariat. Uh, again, as a recap, he proposed revolution as the way for workers to gain control of society. Uh, and uh, he mentioned Marxism, not the same, and the communism, I'm not going to get too much in that, but he did uh, help introduce the conflict theory. Make sure you know Karl Marx for the exam. George Simmel. Uh, he was a German, 1858 to 1918. He was a German art critic who wrote widely on social and political issues as well. Uh, he took an anti-positivism stance and addressed topics such as social conflict, the function of money, and individual identity and city life, and the European fear of outsiders. Much of his work focused on the micro-level theories. Uh, when we get into the macro-micro-level theories, the symbolic interactionist theories more of a micro-level. Uh, conflict and functions is a macro-level. I'll talk about that in my next 
uh, part two. And it analyzed the dynamics of two-person and three-person groups. Uh, his work was emphasized, uh, also emphasized individual and culture as the creative capacities of individuals. His contributions to sociology are not often included in academic histories of the discipline, perhaps overshadowed by his contemporaries, Durkheim, Mead, George Herbert Mead, Emil Durkheim, George Herbert Mead, and Max Weber. And I'll talk about them a little bit later. Emile Durkheim, French sociologist, Durkheim, 1858 to 1917, contributed many important concepts to sociology. His comparison of the suicide rates of several countries revealed an underlying social factor. People are more likely to commit suicide if their ties to others in their communities are weak. He identified the role, the key role of social integration in social life, which remains central to sociology today. So basically what it is, Durkheim looked, and he's the first one to really do some uh, research. Uh, remember, Compte talked about doing research, but Durkheim was one of the ones who also implemented research in which he studied suicide. He looked at the religion piece, he studied it for years, and stated, based upon different variables, he stated religion, male, female, uh, if you're married, unmarried, had children, no children. So he looked at some of those type of factors. And one of the things that Durkheim looked at was a consistent fact of what caused people to commit suicide and said people who are less likely to commit uh, people are more likely to commit suicide if their ties to others in the communities are weak. So therefore, for example, if we have a single man uh, compared to a married man, who's more likely to commit suicide? If there's a married woman and a single woman, a man or woman, you know, a lot of times I've asked students in my class, and it's just a survey of my students in my class over the last uh, seven or eight years, and I asked them, like, who's more likely to commit suicide, uh, a man or a woman? And they looked at different variables. Well, if she's a married woman and children, you know, unless they're more likely to think about, you know, my children, what would be happening, what would take place with my children if I would commit suicide? Uh, so they're integrated into social life that they have their children to think about it compared to a guy like Rambo, uh, the character Rambo, that uh, John Rambo, which he was a you know, single guy. He, you know, it's a long story about how he lost his family. But however, uh, you know, there's nobody here. I'm a single guy. Nobody's going to miss me. I'm not a part of any community ties. I'm not part of the church. Uh, don't have a lot of family members, no wife, no children. But they're saying that people who are stronger community ties in which you call social integration, that people are less likely to commit suicide based upon the research of 1858-1917, uh, research done by Durkheim. Durkheim got sociology recognized as a separate discipline. He studied, and thank him for that, I thank him for that. Uh, he studied how social, for because uh, sociology was mentioned in other courses, so if you had other courses, they would mention sociology. However, Durkheim is the one that said, you know what, let's just make it his own separate discipline, which I do appreciate. Because uh, sociology is a very interesting topic, it's a very good topic to know. He studied how social forces affect behavior. Social forces affect people's behavior, contributed research, social factors, underlying suicide. And again, for the exam, know about Durkheim, but social integration, that people are tied to their social groups as a key factor in suicide. So the more stronger ties you have to the community and social groups, the less likely you are to commit suicide based upon Durkheim's research. Here it is, this is a chart that just talks about how Americans commit suicide. Uh, this was years ago, uh, just showing that and suicide is a very unfortunate thing, and I don't want to really spend time on this and not test you on this for an exam, but uh, it is a very serious, serious situation, and if anyone, I know of someone who's going through this, to seek any type of help to prevent that, uh, but Durkheim's study of suicide just stay consistent. Max Weber and the Protestant Ethics, 1864 to 1920, again, a long time ago. He was another early sociologist who left a profound impression on sociology. Uh, he used cross cultural and historical materials to trace the causes of social change and to determine how social groups affect people orientations to life. 
He is best known for his 1904 book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. The theory that Weber sets forth in this book is still controversial, very controversial. Uh, I'm not going to get too much of that. People say, well, his wife did a lot of his work. Because if you do more research on individuals, you learn different stories. Uh, and, and, and the thing about it is his idea of the Protestant ethic, that he's one of the ones that helped start a capitalism and things like that. So it's a lot of information on that. Uh, it is, you know, it's a lot of viewpoints. So if you read and do more research as independent scholars, you're thinking, so, you know, there's more information about Max Weber. Uh, some believe that Weber argued that the beliefs of many Protestants, especially Calvinists, led to the creation of capitalism. Uh, from what I understand from the story, when, and I wasn't there, of course, but from the story, I understand that, that if you were Roman Catholic at the time, a frame that, you know, based upon a religion, you knew you were going to heaven. However, if you as a Protestant, especially those of the Calvinist tradition, were not sure if they would go to heaven until Judgment Day. So from the Calvinists needed a sign from God stating what would be a good way to know that they're on their way to heaven. So they figured the sign of God to say the sign from God was some money. So if they had money, the more money is the greater chance that they would be going to heaven. Uh, and people began to live frugal lives, save money, even invested money, and which some say led to the creation of capitalism, which is always controversial, but they said that led to the creation of capitalism. Uh, others interpret as simply claiming that the ideologies of capitalism and Protestantism are complementary. But like I said, feel free to do more research. Uh, you got to know the Protestant ethic, uh, spirit of capitalism. You got to know more about Max Weber. For my exam. In the book, The Nature of Social Action, Weber describes sociologists as striving to interpret the meaning of social action and thereby give a causal, a, a causal explanation of the way in which action proceeds and the effects it produces. He and other like minded sociologists propose a philosophy of anti positivism, where so, uh, whereby Social resources were striving for subjectivity as they work to represent social processes, cultural norms, and society values. This approach led to some research methods whose aim was not to generalize or predict traditional insights, but to systematically gain an in depth understanding of the social worlds. So, this is more information about Max Weber. Next slide. So a recap, religion and the origin of capitalism. He disagreed with Marx's claim that economics is a central force in social change. He said that role belongs to religion. Uh, spirit of capitalism, remember the Protestant ethics, invest capital in order to make more money. The spirit of capitalism, Max Weber. Now, as we go into more sociology in North America, we remember during the time frame there was sexism in the United States, across the world as well, but there were women in sociology as well. Racism at the time, we we're gonna talk about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Jane Addams, Talcott Parsons, C. Wright, Mills, uh, so that was more information to bring towards you. Remember back then, attitudes at the time, 1800s, sex roles originally defined, uh, Few people educated beyond basics, so that will, you know, we look back in time, and I got a whole chapter on sex and gender, which we talk about uh, feminism and the rights for women, and and the role that women played, and, and the courage of a lot of women who were, you know, want to make sure that the roles of women were better respected, and, and I have a whole chapter that talked about that, the rise of feminism. Harriet Martinet, very, 1802, look at the time from 1802, 1876. Now she published Society in America, Insightful Analysis of Family, Race, Gender, Politics, and Religion in America. Uh, she published this Society in America before Durkheim and Max Weber were even born. So she was putting in work way before these guys. Uh, her work was, however, was ignored, uh, basically because she was a woman, they didn't really think about uh, her work is being as respected. She was the first to translate Comte's writing from English to English, from French to English, and thereby introduce sociology to English-speaking scholars. 
She also credited with the first systematic methodological international comparison of social institutions and two of her most famous sociological works, Society in America, 1837, and Retrospect of Western Travel, 1838. So it was just not all about the men. There were women who were putting his work as well. So we also have to give credit to the women who were in early sociology. As my grandmother says, not just the men's, uh, it was also the ladies who were putting in work. So it was plural, men's with plural. So I guess it's plural. Men's is more than one men. But that's just old school, as they used to tell you, men's is. So that was just more than the men's. Is it was some ladies putting in work too. Marx and they found the workers of capitalism at odds with the professed moral principles of people in the United States. She pointed out the faults with the free enterprise system in which workers were exploited and impoverished while business owners became wealthy. More information about Martinet. She further noted that the belief in all being created equal was inconsistent with the lack of women's rights. Uh, much like Mary Wollstonecraft, Martinet was often dis uh, discounted in her own time by the male domination of academic sociology. Here's some of the forgotten sociologists, they say, which is a lot of ladies on here. Uh, take your time. I'm not going to test you and, and put a big circle and say fill in the blanks. No, I'm not going to do that. But I just want you to understand that there were a lot of ladies, Frances Perkins, Alice Paul, Marion Talbert, uh, Florence, uh, Kelly, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, Emily Green, uh, Balk, uh, Grace Abbott. You know, these are all a lot of female sociologists, and feel free to do more research on the, women, the, the female sociologists as well, who are very important to sociologists as the men were. Jane Addams, Sexism at the, sexism at the Time and Women and Early Sociologists, uh, American Sociologist, 1860-1935, a recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace, worked on behalf of poor immigrants. With Ellen G. Starr, she founded Whole House, a center to help immigrants in Chicago. Uh, they also have uh, Jane Addams School of Social Work, which is in Chicago. So she would work with immigrants in Chicago and, and help them out. Uh, she was a leader in women's rights, women's suffrage, as well as the peace movement of World War I. So Jane Addams was very active in trying to definitely help people, uh, especially here in Chicago. But very, of course, when you win a Nobel Prize for Peace, uh, you know, working with poor immigrants, very noble thing, and all the other accomplishments that she did as well. Uh, she co-founded the American Civil Liberties Union. She wrote books on poverty, democracy, and peace. And it was rumored that she co-founded the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Some people disagree and say she just wrote her name, signed her name on something, but not to get you know into what she didn't do or what she did do. I just admire the accomplishments of, of uh, what uh, Jane Addams done to help people. W.E.B. Du Bois, he was the first Harvard PhD in America, African, he was the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard. Uh, he published a book each year from 1896 to 1914. However, he was neglected by sociologists until recently. W.E.B. Du Bois, 1868 to 1963, so you can think in his lifetime, he has seen a whole lot of things, especially not just in life in general, but when you look into race as well, uh, that he has seen a lot. I remember reading about um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, stating that when he was a young kid in Georgia, he remembered he walked past a butcher shop and they had the inside the windows, they have, you know, certain foods inside the window, but they had the fingers of a, a black lynching, lynching victim in there as well. So it was on display in a window. Uh, of course, during the time frame, he talked about how he couldn't sleep in the same hotels as his white counterparts. Um, also, he talked about you know, the things that he experienced. And he spent his lifetime studying relations between African Americans and whites, especially during that time frame. Of course, things were a lot different. Like many early North American sociologists, Du Bois 
combined the role of the academic sociologist with that of a social reformer. I mean, he also said, went to the University of Berlin to sit in some of the lectures of Max Weber as well. Got to know W.E.B. Du Bois for the exam, the first exam as well. If you look at the conditions in the 1800s, most people were poor and formal education beyond the several grade, the first several grades uh, was actually a luxury. So they were very poor. And they talked about this photo depicts the conditions of the people Du Bois worked with. Uh, so you can see that a long time ago, uh, 1800s, early 1900s, long time ago. Tuck Cart Parsons and C. Wright Mills Theory versus Reform. Many early North American sociologists saw societies corrupt and in need of reform. Parsons developed objective analysis and models of society, and Mills deployed theoretical abstractions in favor of social reform. Talcott Parsons, 1902 to 1979. By the 1940s, emphasis had shifted to social theory. He developed abstract models of society that influenced a generation of sociologists. Parsons' social action theory was the first broad, systematic, uh, and general, generalizable theory of social systems developed in the United States and Europe. So make sure you're familiar with Tall Car Parsons. Like I say, I'm, due to time constraints, I'm just introducing some of the early sociologists. Always feel free as an independent thinker to do research on each of these sociologists. Uh, Parsons, again, American sociologist and scholar who steered of social action influenced the intellectual basis of several disciplines of modern sociology. His work is concerned with a general theoretical system for the analysis of society rather than with narrow empirical studies. He is credited with having introduced the work of Max Weber and Vilfredo uh, Pareto to American sociology. Talcott Parsons. Make sure you are familiar for the exam with Talcott Parsons. C. Wright Mills was a controversial figure in sociology because of his analysis of the role of the power elite in U.S. society. Uh, he's also pretty much in my social problems uh, class that I teach as well, uh, sociology, social problems class. A lot of information uh, about C. Wright Mills as he's put input into uh, making sure his work was out there. Today, his analysis is taken for granted by many sociologists and members of the public. C. Wright Mills urged sociologists to go back to social reform. He stated, my freedom was threatened by the interests of a group called the power elite. The power elite he considers the top leaders of business, politics, and the military. Social activism made Mills' idea popular among a new generation of sociologists. So he looked at the power elite are the ones who are controlling things. CEOs, big corporations, politicians, and top military leaders, which C. Wright Mills targeted as being called the power elite. So at this point, I'm going to, that's a lot of information. I don't want to put too much on you. So I'm going to end this one, let it marinate a little bit about the early sociologists. Uh, make sure you take time to, uh, to study those, and then I'm going to pick up part two in which I'm going to talk about basic applied and public sociology and the sociological theories, which would be part two. So I'm going to go ahead. I don't want to be long-winded on this one. So I'm going to end part one, and then I will start part two with this particular slide.